to get going now. So um, just a little bit of um, a little bit of housekeeping. If uh, you keep yourselves on mute, I think everyone's on mute anyway. Just while while I'm uh, while I'm going through this, it's mainly some background noise. Uh, keep a tent. I'm crazy without saying, doesn't it? Um, but be ready to put things into chat. I will ask questions. If you're giving me feedback, then it means I can keep stuff on track to be very very pertinent to you. Which of course that's what I want to what I want to deliver. So definitely, chat is an option I'll be using quite a lot. Hopefully, you've all received the worksheet. So again, it just gives a little bit of structure for you to take notes as I'm going through some of these elements, just so you can refer back to them. Because I am going to cover a lot. I'm going to go through lots and lots of ideas, lots and lots of concepts for you to be able to pick some out, take them away, think about them. Um, so yeah, that said, be aware we're going to go at quite a pace. So that's where I want to be now. Let me then just start up the visuals I'll use. So I'm going to present slightly differently. Uh, I think we've all kind of experienced the stuff on screen. So I'm just going to do it a bit differently so that I can present, I can present more naturally. But we've just got a few prompts here beside me. So if I introduce myself, my name is Fred Copestake. I am founder of Brindis. So Brindis is a sales training consultancy. Um, and doing that, I have been around the world 14 times. I've worked in 36 different countries, trained over 10,000 salespeople. And as a result of this, over the last 22 years, I've seen a lot of stuff going on in sales. And what I've been able to do is to capture the stuff that really works and put that into my book, Selling Through Partnering Skills. And so what this gives us is a really modern way of approaching sales to do the stuff that's relevant now. Because one of the things that I saw is that salespeople face a number of challenges. And they're, they're fairly varied, but actually you can distill them down into three main areas. And the three main areas I see are busy, 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 oldie, worldy, and muddled mindset. That's pretty much ways in which you would be able to say, yeah, there's, there's something that my salespeople or me as a salesperson are struggling with. So let's have a little bit of think about those. So busy, busy, busy. This is all about, it's wasting time. It's, it's when salespeople are rushing around, doing lots of stuff, but it's things which aren't really effective. And when things aren't effective, people just do more. And so it's very tiring and it becomes very stressful. It's kind of an inefficient way of working, which isn't sustainable. But unfortunately, the way we think we're going to deal with this is just by chucking more activity at it. So, you know, when I see one of the objects is more effective sales force, it's probably because they're, they're seeing this busy, busy, busy type thing going on. Oldie worldy is about having old fashioned technique. Basically, it's doing things that aren't really relevant anymore. People are stuck in the past. They're doing stuff that isn't working for customers. Yeah, so it's poor techniques. It's old fashioned. And so because it's not adding value, customers can get quite frustrated with this as well. Muddled mindset. Muddled mindset can come at various levels in the organization. So it could be the organization that's muddled in that they're not really sure who they're selling to, how we're going to sell, what's our setup, how do we want to do this? So the poor managers think, well, we're not really sure how we can take our people. And the salesperson at the end of the day is going, well, I don't really know what we're doing. One minute you're saying I'm a consultative salesperson, I'm trying to help customers. End of the month, you're then saying, I've got to hit targets. So now I'm becoming transactional. What's going on here? And so we see this kind of confusion going on, which is equally stressful and, and hard work for, for people, for, for organizations to work in. So one of the things that we can do about that, and this is what I'm going to go into in detail, but at the very high level, if we think about these, Busy, busy, busy is about becoming more effective. So this is about having better processes. It's having steps in place. It's knowing what we're doing. It's going through a methodology that we know is tried and tested and will deliver some results. If salespeople plan better, if they know what they're going to do rather than just trying to make stuff up within the moment, again, we know that we can be more effective with this. Yeah. So 
if we're helping people to be far more prepared in what they do and ready to talk to customers, ready to position how we're selling, then we know we're going to get a far more effective sales force and we're going to get better results. The modern mindset or the, the, the old world is, is, is developed by getting a more modern mindset. So this is usually about flipping what we're doing. I see too many salespeople talk about themselves. They talk about their products, they talk about their services, they talk about their company. It's all me, me, me. They don't focus enough about on the customer. And so this is what we're saying is the best way to be able to combat this oldie worldie. Get up to date, but get up to date by following the process that helps you be more customer focused. Yeah. And really focus on those elements of how can I add value? What do we do with the model mindset? Model mindset is about alignment. So the organization needs to be dead clear about this is how we sell, this is what we do, this is where we're going to market, this is value we deliver. Management can then take this, they can reinforce it, and the key for this is coaching. Coaching has massive impact on sales performance, and managers should be spending time coaching as opposed to purely managing. Now, talk to people, helping them get better, not looking at spreadsheets. So then the individual can be far more aligned because they can be clear, they can be confirmed in this is what I'm doing and this is what's making a difference. I'm on the right path. What I'm doing is with the right intent. So that for me is how we, the challenge that we face, but a broad, high level overview, how we can start to take control and start to do things which are going to make a difference. Collaborative selling is what's going to help us do this. But before we go on, I'm just going to sort of explain a little bit more about who I am and why I should be talking about this stuff. Um, so my first job was in sales. Um, I, uh, I was eight years old um, and we had a family company, a family company that sold kitchens and bathrooms, so was a builder merchant. And when I was eight, I was allowed to go and uh, help, <laughs> probably in inverted commas, at the, at the, uh, the annual Boxing Day sale. And um, what... Uh, what, what, what they did is they basically kitted me out. I had this massive orange polo shirt. I had a big brown warehouse coat. And I went and I was, in, I was in, it was an old Victorian building. It was a big old mill made of stone, thick stone. And bear in mind, we're in the UK in winter. It was cold. And so in this stone building, I was stone cold. But I was having a brilliant laugh. I was talking to people. I was helping them. I was basically helping them select tiles. Yeah, and I was putting my little chip in, a little note saying I'd help them select it. So I got my commission at the end of the day, which is pretty cool. Um, went to Spencer Suites. Um, but I loved it. You know, I really loved that engagement, that talking to people. You know, and then that's, that's me. I love sales. Yeah, I love talking to people. I love helping them. I love sharing stuff. Um, because I know if I share, people can grow. Now, I'm a firm believer of growth mindset. And if we share stuff and help people to get better, you know, we, 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 make, well, we make a lot of better place, if you like. But certainly from the point of sales, because sales is sometimes considered a little bit dirty, a little bit nasty. It's something a bit icky, people don't like. But for me, absolutely, it is, it is a profession. It's something that we should be proud of. It's something that we should say, no, I'm a salesperson. And the stuff we do is actually pretty complex. And sales skills are life skills. Without a shadow of a doubt. And so what I do is I, I, I give my time, I give them time to, to students to help them understand some sales skills so that they can then take them to whatever job they do. They don't even need to be a salesperson. Also, a student is going to have to make the biggest sale of their life, right, which is getting their first job. So if I can help them with influence communication, some of these, these areas, um, hopefully you know, it, uh, it makes a bit of a difference. But for me, it really is all about making selling better. That's, that's what I want to do. Um, and uh, now I want to sort of talk about you know, collaborative selling and how I think that works. But before I do that, I'm aware I've talked for a little bit. Could I ask you just all to put into chat what your favorite decade was and why? What's your favorite decade and why? Was it the 80s because the funky haircuts, the new romantic music? Yeah, was it the 90s, noughties? Pop into chat. Let's have a bit of a, 
bit of fun of this. Just to figure out Sally for a minute. Let's just talk about your favorite decade. Yeah, you don't even have to be born. Maybe it's the 60s. Maybe it's flower power. Maybe that's the stuff that you like. I don't know. Can we pop into chat some of the uh, some of the thoughts that you might have? Favorite decade. I for me, 80s, because I, I like the music. I like the 80s music. Bit sad, but hey. Favorite decade. 90s because we didn't have mobile phones. I'm now a big fan of the 90s. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 80s for music as well. Even though I wasn't bored, yeah, but you know, that doesn't matter. Yeah. 80s for music. <laughs> hey, I know that Diana. Um, so cool. All right, I just realized it's only me seeing some of the notes. So yeah, so yeah, I've got a couple of people saying 90s no mobile phones, 80s music. Seems like 80s music. Okay, cool. I just not bother with presentation. We just got to start playing some eighties music. Are we going new romantic? Are we going rap? Or no? Stop it, Fred. Get back on course. Get back on course. So, um, let's let's talk about all the decades. I want to talk about the evolution of sales because sales has evolved a hell of a lot. Lots of time and effort and research and understanding are put into the world of sales so we can get better at it. Because it's a massive industry, it's such an important part of any business. And that's one of the reasons I get frustrated that it isn't trained so well at unis, but that's by the by. I want to do a quick trip through the decades, point out what the big kind of movements were in sales, which are kind of interesting because it kind of matches the, matches the era. Um, and what I'll do at the end is, again, I'll ask you to pop into chat. What for you stood out as probably the most important thing for your selling today? Okay. But let's have a little think about these. So like I said, they match the era, which is all pretty interesting. And if you think about the 50s, 50s was you know, post-war, so it's all about getting more effective, effective in production, effective in process. And you look at the sales evolutions, it was very much about process, sales process, tried and tested ways in which we could do the same thing again and again and again to be successful. Yeah. Well, okay, well, I'm not going to argue with that. That makes a lot of sense in stuff that we would want to do today. If we look at the 60s, I say I, I do think of 60s as a little bit kind of flower power, psychedelia, that kind of stuff, mind, <laughs> changing the way your mind works. And actually, from a sales point of view, you kind of see this reflected in that a lot of sales training was focusing on the psychology of selling. So think about people's personality, personality styles, how do we adapt to that? How do we do stuff which is going to match the customer better? So adapting to them, which again, for me, makes a load of sense. If we move on to the 70s, 70s, I, I think this was characterized more about benefit selling. Benefits, features, advantages, benefits. What it is, what it does, what it does for the customer. And what's in it for me? And it, I think now, if we can't use that today, if we don't understand that, we've got no basis for any kind of modern, consultative, collaborative, value-based selling. So it's, it's a really important key part that we don't want to throw away. We want to bring it into how we operate. Here's the 80s. Here's the 80s, cassettes, funky music, all that sort of stuff. And, but though it was great for music, I think it was a bit of an odd time for selling. Um, odd from the fact that the, the folks of sales in this close, 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 greed is good type thing. You know, Gordon Gecko from Wall Street, always be closing. And then so some of the techniques, some of the, some of the ways in which salespeople are encouraged to operate, I would still question. Um, that said, there are things that we take away. The concept of advancing, all sales need to advance. We keep needing to move forward. That maybe is the worst thing a salesperson can hear. Yes, no, or this is the next step. That's what we're after. Come the 90s, 90s for me in sales sort of view is probably one of the most important decades. Step change. This is where consultative selling really came to the fore. This is where Neil Rackham, his research with Xerox, tens of thousands of sales meetings, looking at what salespeople were doing and seeing that actually the best salespeople, they weren't doing what they were trained, but they were naturally asking more questions, asking more questions to focus on need. What's the customer's need? And what is it they're trying to achieve? So again, that is something that's absolutely core, should be absolutely core to any way of operating today. As we moved into the noughties, we would take, we would take all of these elements, but we were kind of adding in more of this kind of value-based selling approach. 
So yeah, I understand your need, I understand your pain, sometimes people refer to, but actually, can I really give you gain? Can I put other things in effect to really help you, your business? That's a key area. Keep moving on, moving into the tens. Tens, again, we take these elements, but tens was really the stale stature I was talking about then, but now we probably call it the personal branding. The fact that, look, I'm the person that can do this stuff for you. Yes, my company does, but I'm your account manager you need to speak to. I'm the salesperson that can deliver you the value that you're looking for. We can work together to understand that. Which takes us into the 20s, takes us into now. Um, and for me, collaborative selling, collaboration, working together, co-creating. That's certainly something that was taking effect anyway. And then along comes COVID-19, you know, and so everything thrown up in the air. However, I think what's happened is that this has just accelerated some of the collaborative efforts that salespeople can make. Customers are in a place where they, they need help, they need to look at things differently, they need to do stuff in a slightly different way or maybe very different way. A good salesperson can help them with it. Adding to that, there are new sales practices to getting better at virtual selling. So using some of the technology available, that's probably where mobile phones are a good thing, <laughs> video conference and the rest of it. And we've seen these evolutions. So again, I'm just going to take a little bit of stock, give you a chance to reflect on that. I appreciate I've just thrown a load of decades, a load of kind of sales evolution at you, to have a moment to think about what in there are the, is the biggest thing that really stands out. What's the thing you think, you know what, that has to be the thing for me to build my, my own selling or my team selling around. If I take a moment, I'll let you pop it into chat so I can see it and shout out some of the uh, some of the things because I've realised it's only me who's seeing the chat. So, what are the things that are making you think around that? So, understanding customer need. Yeah. Disruptive selling. Yeah, interesting. For me, that, that's disruptive. And if I'm, I'm making a little bit of reading to this, so I'm thinking that's probably more thinking about kind of challenger sales, which is for me, consultative plus plus. It's kind of the sort of the, the modern approach on asking people questions. In fact, what I'll do is, can you just jump off mute, please? Uh, sort of, and just say, have I read that correctly? Is that, is that what you meant? There, Fred. It's, uh, yeah, so disruptive selling to me is challenging the mentality of the customer to think differently because yeah. of COVID. One, but at the same time, it's more so um, collaborative. So getting yeah. the customer to collaborate with you to come up with a solution versus, hey, I'm just going to, here's the solution and off you go. <laughs> this is what I'm going to say to everyone. <laughs> this is what I do say to everyone. Um, and I read somewhere that if I challenge you, it's a good idea. So I'm going to make your life hard, but with no real purpose. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's doing it with the right intent, isn't it? And go, this is going to be a tough conversation potentially, mm -hmm. but we're doing it because we will both do better from it. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. No, we're, we're exactly on the same page, and that's like exactly how I'm going to talk about collaborative selling and partnering skills in particular, helping us put a real refinement around doing that. Yeah. So we're, we're definitely on the same page there. <laughs> Cool. Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, other people just put in the notes that I'm looking at there. So needs, customer needs. Yeah, of course it does. You know, how can we sell it so we don't need something? Um, and, and benefits. Yeah, back to benefits. If they're not benefiting while they want to. But certainly, yeah, this, this after the evolution of COVID has, has changed stuff. And customers, they want help it. If somebody said to me, so what a great time to be in sales. <laughs> so actually, you ever think about it. Yeah, we can do a load of good. And we can really help people here. And, and if that's what your mindset in selling is, brilliant. Okay, so let me move on. So collaborative selling. So we're in this together. How can we work with customers? How can we help them? Uh, so my, my own mantra is think, learn, do. Yeah, and so this is how I can present things in that, you know, I, I can do a lot of thinking. I can give a lot of the information. I can, I can teach people. I can put it across. You know, 20 years training, bring this. But at the end of the day, salespeople have got to do stuff. The faster we can get some of these new ideas, these new concepts 
into into people's minds. Yeah, the steeper the learning curve, steep learning curves are great. I love steep learning curve. People people talk about them as those bad things. Like no, no, they're great. It means you're doing, you're performing faster. It's going to be quite hard, but it's good stuff. For me, the way to do this. For me, the way to do this is we take sales, the good old stuff that we've talked about already exists, and we're going to take this concept called PQ or partnering skills, and we're going to bring them together. That for me is the way in which we can really achieve disruptive selling, but do it in a nice, elegant way. And so PQ, what is it? It's I sometimes position it as like the lesser known cousin of IQ and EQ, so emotional intelligence. But it's something that a guy called Steve Dent researched and understood back in um, back in uh, the late eighties, early nineties, where big big organisations were partnering, who were coming together, forming alliances, and he looked at the skills which people were using, because his 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 expression, and this is what I use all the time, is that organisations don't partner, people do. Well, back to those people skills, but they're very defined things we can use if we're trying to partner better. So he saw these six elements and. I looked at these and thought, this is brilliant. This, this actually, any salesperson needs to get their head around. Whether we're talking about a full-on partnership, whether you're managing partners in channel, or you are selling to direct, you're selling direct sales, this stuff will give you a real kind of compass and way to manage the way in which you operate. So what are these elements? So I'm going to go through them very, very quickly. First is trust. Trust foundational. Trust is all about good communication. If we build trust with people, the other elements we can really start to use. And, and they're all interlinked. So salespeople should be very aware, very wary. How can we build trust? How can we do things very deliberately to be trustable? Yeah, that's a made up word. Trustable as in people are able to trust us, so trustworthy, but we are also able to trust others. If we can do that, we're in a good place to sell. So this will be down to the concept of win-win orientation. Are we focused on win-win? Mutual benefits, outcomes for the customer, results for us. Those have got to be compatible. We've got to, we've got to have that balance. Now, many salespeople know this, but when we break that down and what it actually means, understanding people's expectations, the outcomes they need, how we have conversations, how we negotiate, how we discuss, how we deal with conflict, lots of elements to that. Another element is the comfort with interdependence. Interdependence, not independence. The lone wolf salesperson is not effective. Salespeople have got to work with their own team. They've got to work with customer teams. We've got to be comfortable with the fact that our success is going to be based on other people's success. Our results are going to be dependent on others. The more comfortable we are with that, the better we're able to operate as a professional seller. Self-disclosure and feedback. Self-disclosure and feedback. So this is all about, we talked about disruptive self. So um, sometimes feeding back to customers say, look, I don't think what you're going to do is right. Yeah, you, or you're not helping me help you. We're supposed to be working together on this, but you're not really sharing stuff. Equally, it's disclosing, it's sharing information about yourself. We, we talk about authenticity, vulnerability is quite, quite big in this sales at the moment. Um, but just saying, look, these are my needs, these are my expectations. I've got to have something out of this too. So we're looking for win-win. Comfort with change. Salespeople are change agents. We sell change. Status quo is our biggest enemy. That's the kind of biggest competitor, if you like. So we've got to be comfortable in changing ourselves because otherwise we've got no right in talking to anybody else about how they should change. And we've got to understand how people change, the process they go through, the fact that it is difficult, we don't naturally like it, and that people go through stuff at different paces. And we might be totally overchain, think it's an opportunity, think it's brilliant, other people might be struggling. And if we mismatch how we communicate, it can be quite, quite stressful for them. And the sixth element of partnering skills or PQ is um, future orientation. So it's looking forward, looking to where we want to be, making decisions based on that result, that future orientation, that future outcome, as opposed to, well, this is what we always did. And now more than ever, what we always did is probably going to be one of the most irrelevant conversations. Again, a bit like the English itself, don't throw it all away, don't take lessons from it, but just be a little bit aware of that we're moving forward all the time. 
Now, I've gone through those super quick. Again, we're on limited time in this, in this session anyway. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a tool that I use with customers um, that means you can go online and have a uh, take, take, a, take, a, take an audit that um, take an audit that will help you understand how you score on each of those and give you some reflective questions, reflective questions on how you can get better with that. So I'm just going to pop that into chat. Probably a stupid thing to do because you'll now go and play with that. But certainly, if you click that, open it on a tab, have a look at it afterwards, and you'll get a feeling for what those elements are. Because I know I did go through them very, very quickly. Because I want to talk also about how we can then bring them in to our way of working. Uh, so PQ, six elements, partnering skills, they give us this kind of mindset that's really conducive with modern collaborative selling. So PQ one hand, sales stuff on the other hand, the evolution of sales, how do we bring them together? What's the kind of the, the magic formula, if you like? The way I go about it, what I wrote in the book is around the value framework, the A-L-U-E. These stand for different parts of a it's not a process which is a framework that we can pull the bits in that are relevant for us and our teams to be able to adapt this approach or adopt this approach and so briefly what are, what are these things about the v stands for validate yeah so you might call it qualification in old-fashioned terms yeah the, the concept is it takes two to tango if we want to work in this way we've got to have people who want to work in this way back yeah, otherwise we end up with competitive selling and we're trying to force people to do stuff, we're trying to manipulate them, we go all 80s and it, it just won't work. So we've got to be pretty selective on how we operate, who we operate with. The more selective you are, the better job you can do because next comes the phase of alignment, which is all about doing homework, understanding the customers, understanding the customers are homework better than they understand themselves. Yeah, understanding decision-making units, more and more people are getting involved in sales. We know in, in sales decisions, but buying decisions. We know this. Garment statistics tell us this. Yeah? I, I think that's only going to go up with COVID, personally. A couple of people think, well, it's going to go down because more people get higher, um, are empowered more for bigger decisions. I think more people get involved. Where do we think we could potentially add value? Potentially add value. Doesn't necessarily mean it will be because value is defined by customers. But we need to really give us a solid basis of information and understanding that we can use to move the conversation forward. So we take this information and we leverage it. We have good sales interactions with people, you know, to the point that we, we understand how to run sales meetings. We understand ask before tell, classic, you know, questioning skills. Now, of course, we're having to move all this stuff online and there's, some, there's, there's ways to work in virtual, um, virtual selling that we need to, to adopt. But really, it's just taking the good best practice stuff and just delivering it in a slightly different way. Yeah, we can actually do it effectively. And I believe there are some advantages to it as well. So we can have more, we have better cadence, we can see people more often, we can bring more people in, we can we can make stuff happen potentially quicker. Face to face is always potentially well, always gonna be better, really, because we get that full range of emotion, we can really read people better. But there are other things we can do to bring um, virtual video and technology into play that, that work for us. U stands for underpin. So we're trying to come up with how we can work together, how we can co-create value, and then how we can how we can support that, how we can stack that up. And I think of it a bit like a three-legged stool. And we've got to resonate, differentiate, substantiate. Resonate. We've got to be on the same wavelength. We've got to be talking about something that's relevant and important and makes a difference to the customer. Substantiate. We've got to. We've got to prove. We've got to back it up. Yeah. Um, that's on mute. Uh, so, and resonate, substantiate, and substantiate uh, to differentiate. Being different does not make you different, does not become a differentiator. Yeah? So it's got to be 
pertinent. It's got to be important for the customer. So resonate, differentiate, substantiate. We try to eliminate FUD factors, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They're real showstoppers when it comes to sales and particularly more complex, sophisticated selling, where collaborative selling certainly lends itself. And then we need to evolve. We need to evolve the sale. We need to manage the account. We need to, this is all about longer term success. So we need to work with customers and do the things to make sure that we are delivering their outcomes, delivering the results we promised, but then see, can we expand the opportunity? Can we grow? Can we do more? So for me, that's how the value framework works. We bring all of the sales best practice, the PQ mindset into play to work in these kind of ways, in these kind of areas. That's how broadly we bring these things together. Yeah. Is this for you? <sighs> Interesting question, because it's not for everybody. Some people will not be able to do this. Some people will just not be able to adapt themselves. And well, I think we should to face that. Other people will take this and run with it and be fantastic at it. Uh, so that's that's the kind of the question. That's that's one of the reflections. I the biggest reflection I'd like you to take off the back of this, off the back of this, your investment of this time, me talking with you. Um, a lot of it is to do with your values. And what I find is the people that can adapt to this and use this way of working best tend to be a bit more adventurous. So they're willing to try stuff, they're willing to do stuff that's a bit different. They'll put their neck above the line, the neck on the line. They will tend to be more creative, so they can think outside the box. They will tend to like to do stuff in different ways. And also, they'll tend to be comfortable with technology. Technology is an enabler because to really make this stuff work and to bring different parties together, technology is a means, as much as anything to communicate, works, work, works best. Again, what I'll do, and we'll send it out afterwards, um, I use a scorecard required to get them to be able to, to assess where are they now, to then focus on what's the stuff they could do to make that difference. And, and even actually, do they fix? If it's not right for them, actually, it's a bit like pushing water uphill. It makes no sense. But for the people it does, absolutely, it will make a difference in the way you work. So, in the nearly famous words of vanilla ice, or nearly words, stop, listen, collaborate yeah i know he said stop collaborate and listen but for me that's just slightly wrong as a salesperson we listen first listening is one of the key skills so yeah stop slow down listen to customers work out how we can collaborate but equally bearing in mind what i've just said stop listen to yourself listen to your heart and is this something i can do is it something i can take on board is it something i can really use to make a difference if you believe it is happy days yeah i'm with you i will help you as much as i can to, to make these shifts yeah what math two ears absolutely two ears one mouth that's what i just popped into 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 the chat two ears one mouth what i also say two eyes two eyes because then we read people which is why on virtual we need to get people cameras on makes them more engaged but also we can see them and for me the biggest is two feet as well actually you put your feet in their shoes a salesperson that can put their feet in somebody else's shoes empathize, understand something from someone else's perspective, yeah, they will really know what to talk about. They'll know how to help. So the two-to-one ratio, I'm a massive fan of, yeah? So, yeah, that's cool. We're, all, we're again, on the same page there. Um, but I was saying, you know, so you know, stop listening to everybody. Listen to yourself, yeah? And if I can help, you know, brilliant. What, what can you do? What can you do in the meantime? Certainly, you yeah, know, grab a book, read the book. Please do. You know, I'm very happy if you have a look at that. Um, I also have a podcast. If you want to listen to the podcast, what I'll do is I'll invite guests on and we go through the elements of PQ, how they apply it. So I talk to trainers, I talk to authors, I talk to people who, who you know, sales directors, sales practitioners, people are doing this stuff day in, day out. Uh, I've, got some, I've had some really interesting guests on there, so some, some fantastic episodes on there. PQ audit, okay, I've given you the link for that. Have a, have a, little, have a little play with that. Um, again, judge where you are and think, okay, what are I scored weaker on? How can I do better on it? Use these reflective questions on it. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm on social media. So, yeah, I've got a pretty unique name, Fred Copestake. Not many of those around, but there's none. 
Um, so yeah, if you want to find me on YouTube, Twitter, Insta, LinkedIn, I probably use the most of those. Makes my sense as a business person. Uh, or Facebook. Yep, I've got all of those covered. So there's information. I'll try and share as much about this stuff as I can because you know I, I want people to take it on board. I want I want sales to get better. Yeah, get in touch with me direct. Yeah, professional sort of guy. You see that? Um, so yeah, Fred at Brindis, please get in touch. End of the day, I want to be the person that really brought PQ to the sales world. If I'm known as that, yeah, that'd be a fantastic legacy. That's that's what I want to do because that's not about me. I want I want salespeople to be proud. I'll be proud about what they do. They're proud about how they work. Proud about how they can help their customers. Yeah, it's whole head out. Say, yeah, I'm in sales, <laughs> and it's a it's a it's a tough job. There's lots of elements to it. Yeah, so that's that's kind of me. That's kind of where where, where we're at on this. Um, it's all the information I wanted to share. I've tried to go through it pretty fast, uh, certainly around the value framework, because I wanted to make time to answer questions. I know on these these kind of events, it's better if I can answer stuff and make it very pertinent to you guys while uh, while you're while you're here and while you've invested your time. So that's that's the content. I stop that now. I'm open to questions. Pop me in chat or even better, come off mute, fire them at me. And uh, let's see what, what difference we can we can make here and now. Or comments. Maybe you hate it. I'm trying to do it. <laughs> what kind of questions? Okay, I've got one. Okay, well, it's just come through straight into me on chat. Um, it's uh, sure, John, as you said, it's about qualifications. Qualification different for collaborative selling. Um, so I talked about taking two to tango and how we do it. Um, yes and no. <laughs> so again, it's a little bit take some of the elements of what we would traditionally do to look at whether the opportunity makes sense. Um, so is it, is it attractive to us? We still look at those elements, money, authority, need, time, competition, those sort of things. But what I encourage people to do is kind of have a, is a psychological element to it. So like I said, is that how do they operate? How do they work with their customers? You know, what are people who work for them? How do they feel about it? Is it a decent organization? Do they actually partner? Or do they just say they do? And I'll try to look for some more of those qualitative elements to be able to make that decision of whether they're right to work with. So that's where that's where the validate or the qualification bit is is upgraded, if you like, into, into collaborative sales. Great. Uh, what would you say in terms of collaborative selling is you, you're looking at a couple of different um, influences in buying, um, let's say, circle. So you got your customer, you got your potential partners or referrals, whomever that might be. How do you manage different, uh, let's say, different groups uh, to basically get them to come together and, and ultimately to the favor of the customer as well as yourself? Brilliant. It's um, it's a it's a little bit like being an orchestra conductor. This and then one of the models that I often I often talk to people about is to be collaborative. Move from a bow tie model to a diamond model. And so what I mean by that is if you imagine a bow tie where you've kind of got sort of triangle with a little spot in the middle, the spot in the middle is a salesperson, everything goes through there. That's massively ineffective. Yeah, I think I think you were talking about effectiveness anyway. And that's salesperson becomes like a postman. You know, they're going, everything's going through them. If we turn it into a diamond so that we're getting people who need to match up to match up and we're facilitating that, we're affecting the introductions, you know, we're getting finance people to sort of finance people, we get logistics to sort of logistics. We get bosses to talk to bosses. Yeah. That is a clever salesperson. A lot of people don't like this, which I say it's not for everyone because they just can't give up that control. They're like, oh, no, it's going go through me. It's my account. It's not your account, the company's account. And if you can do that, you become far more effective. And so it's, it's kind of stepping back and going, that's my job, it's to manage these bunch of relationships. And, and to do that effectively, it's like it's knowing it's knowing your musicians, so it's knowing the people. What do they need? What are their expectations? Yeah, you know, what's their KPI? What's the business stuff? What's what's their personal motivator? What are they trying to get out of it? 
is it's really about information, understanding people, understanding what they're trying to achieve, and then being able to sort of match up and deliver on that. It's complex. <laughs> does, that, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, so don't mean to hog the entire conversation here, but just no, no, one final question in relation to it. Um, I'm thinking, for example, um, as a disruptive startup, you've got to get your marketing, you've got your sales team to work collaboratively because there's so much noise out there and you've got to get your channel partners and so on. So um, we're in IT space. So right, okay. work together. Right? And for... Uh, for the pre-sales to get involved into conversations, for example, at different levels, the CFO, the procurement, as well as the, we're in HR, we're selling a HR solution in HR space oh. as well. Um, it becomes at times overwhelming, right? For the customer and us as well. So one thing that means uh, is really beneficial is a detriment to the other person. How would you kind of, you know, position it so that, hey, it's for the better of the company, not just you. Because people buy for their functions. And when you're looking at enterprise, we all know that, right? They're, to improve yeah. their function, they don't really, honestly, to be honest, they don't care for the benefit of the company that much as, unless they are C-suite. Yeah, it's funny if I do, I do quite a bit of work in IT, so I know exactly what you're, what you're talking about there. And when I'm training IT guys, I'll say basically, and it's basic, there's, there's four different areas you've got to sell into. Yeah, there's technical, there's the IT people yep. who will get really fascinated about function. And that tends to be where a lot of IT salespeople are very comfortable because that IT fascinates them. They love those conversations. They get right down in the weeds. They talk about functionality, this feature, this thing, this button does this, whatever. But then what we need to do is saying, but at some stage, finance or procurement are going to get involved. They speak a different language. They're bothered about different stuff. We've got to get heads around it. Mm -hmm. So either you as the salesperson, learn what that language is, learn what floats their boat. Or we have somebody that we can then introduce that is the finance specialist. You know, maybe it's your FD, get them to speak. Because if, you know, a lot of IT does the same stuff, let's face it, you know, and you probably hate me saying that. But, but it's the way we deliver the outcome. And if the outcome and all they should attract it is the clever financing of it, well, then let's get the clever finance guy talking to the guy who needs the clever financing. Mm. I think also in your space, where people miss a trick is the line of business. And you saw that HR. So yeah, absolutely, you know, the HR don't care about how the IT works. It's what it does. So you take the HR person about this, does that, and this sort of, you know, feeds and speeds and all the rest of it. They're like, I don't care. I'm doing this because I want people to be better at what they do. <laughs> you know, I want them to be happy. I want them to be well. I want them to get paid on time or, you know, whatever the solution is doing. So when we talk about line of business, it's been very, very clear about what they're trying to achieve. And then, of course, with C-suite, it's don't be boring them with detail. Don't be getting into, again, feeds and speeds or, or maybe even the finance stuff. That's what I've got finance director for. It's this is going to help you in the grand scheme of things. And, and if it isn't, if it doesn't have that big an impact at that kind of strategic level, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just that it doesn't. So don't just go and sell to C-suite because everyone said it's a good idea. If it's not going to interest them and you could burn your bridges and do self-damage, Leave them, but do a bloody good job, but with the other people who are in that fine committee decision-making unit. Yep. Thank you very much for that. Uh, pleasure. And going back to validate and qualify, qualify out. <laughs> Don't go chasing after every single thing, particularly where it sounds like you might be, where there's a lot of stuff and it's busy, 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 yeah? It's like, we're busy, busy. If we want to chase every single thing, why? Because we need it. We need the business. But as I say, that's not an opportunity. Yeah, it is. No, just because it's on a bit of paper on your desk, which on the CRM, doesn't mean it's an opportunity. It's just not that. It's just not right for you. Be confident to qualify out. To, and then, you know, if you make it a bit more objective and you kind of build your, your template, template of ideal customer, to be able to make it more mathematical, you know, that's not for us. But the good news is these guys are, and we can give them more time and effort to do what we've just said really, really well. Yeah? Thank you. Oh, brilliant question. No, brilliant question. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Uh, I have a question concerning, you know, when you get into a sales pitch and uh, things turn out to be uh, like um, a price war where you don't want to get into the price war. Uh, all of uh -huh. those values uh, go away and now you, they are just 
uh, are, they are fighting you with their price, maybe uh, faster delivery. That's the whole thing. Uh, what can you yeah. do, like, uh, what are your insights about this aspect? Perfect. Thank, thanks, thanks, Mohammed. Um, what has tended to happen if you're getting to sort of near the end of the sales process and we're now negotiating and we're kind of haggling over price is that people aren't seeing value. So we've almost, when I talk about the alignment of the leverage piece, so the alignment is this is where I think they can really get a load of value. This is where I've done stuff with other organizations and they've got fantastic results because our solution has got all these working parts to it. We sell the whole of the solution. That's what I reckon. But as a colleague of mine says, value is a mystery. It's not for me to go and say what a customer's value is. I've got to then work out with them what they think it is. And go, yeah, you know what? My homework was right. It is. Pick, position that, present that as this is what's going to help you get to where, where you want to be. And you need all of these elements, which have a cost to them. Yeah, that's why the price is the price. Because you want to buy the result. You want to buy the outcome. And the more we can get people focusing on that, rather than the little bits of stuff that they're buying, they're there for a reason, but it's to deliver on the result. That helps us move away from that price discussion. Which doesn't mean we're not going to get it, but it, it sets us up for when we're having a discussion, which kind of means that if they need the outcome, they need the outcome. They'll be looking at somebody else, other people. The question, and again, it's very blunt, but you, know, get, you get the, the, the feel of the question. The question is, if we were the same price as them, who would you buy from? Them being the competitors. Now, if they say them, but well, I, I don't think they say them. So why are we having this conversation then? Because the other people are better and cheaper. Go. They're going to say you, but they want to get it for the same price. So, okay, this is cool. Right. So why? Well, what I like, Mohammed, is that you guys do this. Yeah. Well, your solution also does this. Yeah. And you do this as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they then tell you the stuff that's the differentiator. So we're not comparing apples and apples. It's apples and pears. They've told you all this stuff. So then we're saying, well, you know, this is why the price is different. Now, if they're still pushing back on price, it's okay, we'll start to take this stuff out. Yeah which will mean that the solution won't work as well, or it won't be quite as elegant, or it might take a little bit longer. And that's when we're now negotiating. So if you're not happy not to have this, then I can drop the price. Yeah, so you get into this, but you're subtracting stuff to get the price coming down. But they're also seeing that the value and the stuff that you're delivering is also going down. So it, it keeps you focused in on that. At the end of the day, this is what we're trying to do for you. We're trying to help you with these things. Yeah, as part of our collaboration, as part of our co-creation, we were understanding this stuff and that's why i built it as it is and we start pulling it apart make it cheaper it's not going to be as impactful hey what about a cheaper car okay, i'll take the wheels off <laughs> well it work as well is it that 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 kind of makes sense to you yeah it makes sense it makes sense in a, in a way or another it makes sense yeah is it is it what what, what kind of things are you selling mohammed uh, we we sell things related to the payments ecosystem, so like uh, cards, printers, and uh, you know when when it comes to like uh, uh, a competition, um, they don't exist. They haven't been for long, but they just put uh, a very tough price. And uh, you know these days everybody is looking for the cheapest thing for for the uh, same specs specifications if you go for for that yeah i mean th there is another tactic and it's again it, I'll, ta I'll take this from sort of older selling but it's quite a good one to use in the right time and place um it's to create fud remember i talked about fear uncertainty and doubt these are the big showstoppers it's what buyers what customers don't like so actually you can use it in your favor normally we don't want it okay but we can put it in our favor where it would be saying something like, they're offering you what price? Oh, that's brilliant. That is a really good price. I think you should go for that. No, go for it. Get signed up. Get signed up quickly. Oh, what do you mean? Well, at that price, everybody's going to go and buy from them. So I just hope they've got the stock. You know, I hope they can deliver on that. Because that's brilliant. In fact, you know what? We might go and buy from them as well. Don't say any more. You've done your job, and they're now thinking, Mm, well, what's going on there then? You've not 
you've not been disrespectful. You've not said the competitor is bad. You've, you've stayed professional, but you just put that little seed of doubt in their mind going, oh, what? And if they say, well, well no, I, look, I don't want to talk about my competitors. <laughs> you just have, but yeah. I know what we do. I know our cost structures. I know what's fair and what we come out of it well and what you come out of it well. So we talk about the, you know, the outcomes. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where we're at. If they can do it that way, that's brilliant. I really want to know how. Again, another little seed of doubt. So that, that makes sense. That's more of a tactic, but it works. In the right time and place, it works. Yeah, it, it works at some points where uh, where they are like not really confident about the product, um, yeah. and it happens sometimes that we we use this technique and uh, we yeah. just uh, say that uh, check the quality when you get your product. We push yeah. them to that edge, and yeah. they get the quality, and then they come back to us. Yeah. That's the other thing. So yeah, go for it. Yeah, sign up. Look, if there's any issues, you know where I am. And okay, it's a bit annoying because you want to get the order. Of course, we all do. But it's a bit of a longer game. Collaborative selling is a bit of a longer game. And you've you've maintained your professionalism. You can hold your head high. It's like, okay, that's and that's what's going on. They're buying the market. Okay. Um, yeah, another way of expressing it is that's cool. I mean, I, I know our costs. I got a reasonable idea of theirs. I don't know if they're making money on it. They'll have to get that back somehow. But anyway, look, that's their problem, not mine. Just enough to say it. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, it's good. Any other thoughts people have that I could help with or share? What? Okay. What I'll ask you to do, if that's okay, and you'll probably put the uh, the message just into me. It's up to you how you put it, share to everyone, share just to me. Could I ask you to just put into chat what your biggest takeaway from today is? Now, I appreciate I actually have thrown a lot at you. Um, but if there's a couple, you know, one thing that you think, oh, I need to go away and think about that. By putting it into chat, it's going to make, it's going to prime your brain to think about it more anyway. If I see what a couple of these things are, I could probably just add another couple of little things into that. I'm aware we've got about what a couple of minutes. I'm not going to run away actually. So I know we're scheduled for an hour, but you know, I'm I'll talk about this stuff all day, as you can probably guess. Um, but yeah, if you could just pop into chat, you know what we, we I like to talk about that aha moment. Aha, that makes sense to me. So yeah, takeaway learning, aha moment. That'd be pretty cool. Because I could just add into that a little bit if, uh, if that's appropriate. So What aha moments that we had? Two years or my, I don't know, that was from before, but I'd say that I start still, I will talk about pretty much every training I do because it's timeless. Um, so what aha moments have you had? What are you going to do as a result of this? I'm using a Cialdini influence technique here because if you say it, <laughs> if you put it out there, we like to be consistent to ourselves. So if you're kind of committing to it, you're more likely to go and do it. So actually, you get a bit more investment of your time on listening to this. That's why. And, and of course, I like feedback. You know, I'm going to talk about feedback. I have to talk about feedback. I'm going to, I'm going to get that as well. So. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll say they were late, but uh, it's been recorded, so I'm pretty pretty sure you'll be able to pick up the, the early stuff on, on the recording. I'm not sure what time you joined. You might you might have heard us. <laughs> you might you might what did you miss? You missed us talking about eighties music. <laughs> um, no, we talked about evolution sales. So again, I'm not sure what what stage you um, what stage you joined. I'm pretty sure the recording's available. So other. Aha moments. So feeding back to the customer if they're not helpful. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of interpersonal skills required on that. We've got to be careful. But again, the better the partnership, the better the relationship, the better you are genuinely working together, 
and trying to achieve stuff, you know, you can you can actually quite great with some people. Say, look, you're not helping me help you. Oh, I didn't realize I thought it was no. Okay. Some people find it harder. And I appreciate there are cultural differences in this. Any other takeaways from that? Vanilla ice is a hero. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So if I've reminded you of vanilla ice, you're going to go back and see ice ice baby to yourself all day, the rest of the day. Then that's that's cool. <laughs> Just remember, it's to do with collaborative selling. Collaborate and sell. Add that little line in. That'll help. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate we, we're now getting to the hour, and some people might have only booked that time off. So. Again, I'm not going to run away. Any la any questions that you want to ask? Otherwise, I will start to wrap up. If you, if you want to hang around, if you want to kind of put to ask something, maybe if other people have dropped off, that that's cool. I'm happy to do that. Like I said, you, know, you can always get in touch with me as well. I'm more than happy to do that, as you can, as you can expect. I want to I want to make sales better. Like I say, end of the day, um, I want salespeople to be proud. They're proud about what we do, yeah, because we know that we're doing stuff which is going to help help people. Yeah, that, that's what we're in this for. We want to share. We want to help. And if PQ is the way in which you can you can adjust your mindset, you can really start to focus in on what I suspect is a lot of good stuff you're doing anyway. You wouldn't be on these kind of sessions if you weren't already doing it. So you know, I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the converted. Um, you know, that, that's what I want to do. So, look, please reach out. I'm very, very happy to help you. And have a look at that collaborative selling scorecard we're going to send. And any tweets, any things I can help, yeah, give me a shout. Please do. Totally open offer. <laughs>